Okay, welcome to everybody. So tonight's event is part of an ongoing year-long series of sessions that are marking JR's 20th anniversary. And in particular, we're celebrating the launch of our first book, Age of Confidence, The New Jewish Culture Wave. This is a series of five essays written by experts in their fields that look back at the development of Jewish film, theater, literature, art, and music over the past 20 years, and look forward to discuss how Jewish arts might evolve over the coming decades. Over the year, we're using each essay as a springboard for a further discussion on the subjects that they raise. And tonight, I'm delighted to introduce the first of such conversations, which will be chaired by Nathan Abrams, who wrote the section of our book on film. As well as discussing the impact of Jewish actors, writers and promoters on the world of film and the challenges they might face, for example, should Jewish actors be cast in Jewish roles, we'll be particularly addressing the issue of women in film, asking where are our UK Jewish women filmmakers and what could women's, voice, what could women's voices um, add to the representation of Jewish life in the UK? So tonight's event is in partnership with UK Jewish Film, which has been celebrating a special anniversary of its own this year. It's 25 years since its founder, Judy Ironside, first set up the organization, showing films at a small event in Brighton. UKJF has since then gone on to become the major exhibitor of films with Jewish themes in the UK and Europe. And we're so pleased that Judy is joining us tonight. So just to ask you all that we'll be uh, letting, you answer, letting you ask questions to our panel throughout the evening, if you can put your questions into the chat function and, uh, and we'll put them to our guests. And please send them uh, as soon as you, 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 you think of them and uh, we'll be about half an hour before we finish, we'll be going over to your questions. So I'd like to briefly introduce our panelists and then we'll begin our conversation. So firstly, joining us from LA is Sarah Soleimani. Hello, Sarah. Hi. Sarah, hello, hello. Sarah is an actress, writer and activist. She's appeared on our TV screens in the BAFTA winning sitcom Him and Her, as well as in Brief Education and No Offense. Her film credits include Bridget Jones's Baby and How to Build a Girl. She is the writer and executive producer of Wrigley Road, the recent BBC drama that was adapted from Joe Bloom's novel. And many of us have probably enjoyed this lively and gripping thriller that was described by the Times as a sip of champagne after weeks of supermarket cola. <laughs> She's the co-creator and co-star with Steve Coogan of Chivalry. Channel 4's forthcoming Me Too satire, and is currently working with Mary Trump to create a TV adaptation of Mary's book about her uncle, Too Much and Never Enough for TV, which I think many of us will be looking forward to. She's the founder of Raising Films, a campaign to help working parents in the UK screen sector, and has also campaigned for the rights of sex workers. I'd also like to introduce Susanna Wise. Susanna, hello. Susanna is an actress and writer who grew up in London and the Midlands. Her TV credits include EastEnders, Channel 4's comedy Peep Show, and the series Derek. A childhood spent outdoors inspired her love of nature and tree climbing. And the memory of that, along with the death of her father in 2015, were the catalysts for her first novel, This Fragile Earth, which she describes as a love letter to the countryside I grew up in and which was published last June. She studied writing at the Faber Academy and during her time there wrote a second novel, which comes out next July. Both books have been long listed for the Miss Lexia Prize. I'd also like to introduce Judy Ironside, MBE. Judy is the founder and president of UK Jewish Film, which she, she set up in 1997. In 2007, she founded the Pairs Short Film Fund at UK Jewish Film to encourage and promote filmmaking with Jewish themes. She's currently the director of the Geneva International Jewish Film Festival, which she founded in 2011. 
She's also an ambassador for the Forgiveness Project, which supports reconciliation and conflict resolution through storytelling and shared experiences. And finally, our chair, Nathan Abrams. Nathan is professor in film at Bangor University, where he is also the director of impact and engagement for the College of Arts, Humanities and Business. He is the lead director for the Center for Film, Television and Screen Studies and a co-convener for the British Jewish Contemporary Cultures Network. He is co-founder of Jewish Film and New Media, an international journal. But most of you probably know Nathan for his books on Stanley Kubrick. Eyes Wide Shut, Stanley Kubrick and the Making of His Final Film, and Stanley Kubrick, New York Jewish Intellectual. His other books are Hidden in Plain Sight, Jews and Jewish, Jewish Nests in British Film, Television and Popular Culture, and The New Jew in Film, Exploring Jewishness and Judaism in Contemporary Cinema. So I'm sure you'll agree that we're in the hands of an excellent, distinguished lineup here to discuss our themes tonight. So I'd like to hand over now to Nathan to kick us off with some questions for our panel. Um, thank you very much, Rebecca. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, I can't resist just to point out that Bridget Jones is possibly our most famous alumna of Bangor University. <laughs> um, random, but not Jewish connection. Um, anyway, um, OK, so I'm just going to put the questions to our panel and um, um, I'll, I'll open with one, I, I suppose, whoever would like to go first, perhaps you could just open with a general one on um, maybe you could um, give us some insight into your experiences of being uh, of, of being Jewish women working in British film and television. Very broad. <laughs> then we can narrow in. Susanna, go on. Yes, I'll start. That's fine. Sorry. Um, uh, so my experiences of being a Jewish woman in film and TV in, in this country, and I'll be interested to hear what Sarah's going to say, because she'll have a very uh, different perspective, having worked in Britain and in America, um, is that, and I think you and I, Nathan, have talked a little bit about this, um, is that uh, I have played a lot of Jewish parts. Um, I've auditioned for a great many of Jewish parts. Um, uh, I'm sometimes considered not Jewish enough because my father's Jewish, but my mother is not. Um, and sometimes I'm too Jewish <laughs> to play Gentile parts. Um, so that's been my experience. I, I've, I've done a lot of um, uh, theatre work with uh, Jewish read-throughs, uh, well, Jewish subject matters and read-throughs. Um, I found that um, people when I'm auditioning to play a Jew if the casting people and the gatekeepers are not Jewish they want me to be more Jewish and um, that's kind of been my experience um, uh, I very much enjoyed playing a whole variety of different um, Jewish people Jewish women um, with varying um, opinions on their own Jewishness um, their faith and their culture uh, and almost without exception, every time I've played a Jew, I've had feedback from, well, audience or people I know who are Jewish about <laughs> um, their experience of watching me play a Jew. There's always an opinion <laughs> about, about it. So um, either the character isn't, you know, how they would have liked it portrayed or the writers, or, or I, you know, it's, it, there's always so much um, a, a sort of, a polarized view of 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 um what it is to be um a jewish female character and maybe that's just a jewish character maybe that's not a female thing but as a female that's um obviously i can only speak from that perspective um so that's been my experience Shall thank I you very much in the uh, the two um so over the 25 years i think what we do struggle with and have always struggled with is getting films that are British, UK made films. Uh, we show films from all over the world, international films, and we, we receive about 600 new films with Jewish themes 
every year, which never fails to amaze me. Uh, we are obviously so interesting, us Jews, and there's always more to say and different ways to say it. Uh, and of course, we are constantly seeking British made films um, featuring both male and female actors and actresses. But it has, it has been definitely a lack over these 10 years. And I can't say that it ch is changing that much. Um, I think it, it's a good time for me to put a plug in because what we have done is for the last uh, 11 or so years, we created the Pairs Short Film Fund at UK Jewish Film. And that was really to try and address this issue and two films are made each year. We receive 60 to 80 scripts. And these films are made with Jewish themes, not necessarily by Jewish writers or directors, I think is, a, is, a, is another bonus, but it's really a way to try and encourage um, Jewish film themed filmmaking in the UK. And we do also, and I'll come back to that later, try to encourage our winners, our two winners each year, to cast Jewish actors and actresses in their Jewish roles. I've been in one of those, Judy. <laughs> <laughs> Which one? Uh, it's Amy Rosenthal's That Woman. Right. It was very good. Yes. Um, Lewinsky. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, um, Sarah. Well, first of all, hi everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to be on this panel and, and talk about these things with you. Um, I think probably the, the most useful thing to contribute was my experience in trying to get Ridley Road made, which was a long journey. And um, I read Joe Bloom's book and was just fascinated by this period of British history, which I didn't really know much about, which was for anyone who hasn't seen the show, it's about, um, uh, fascist revival in 1962, a true story. And there were swastikas in Trafalgar Square and there was a organized fascist movement called the National Socialist Movement that paraded up and down Jewish areas to intimidate Jewish and minority people. And a, a group of people clubbed together called the 62 Group to fight them off the streets. And they did successfully push them to the fringes of British politics. So for me, this is a very interesting, uh, relevant story and I couldn't get it made. Um, and it, I think there were some emails about it being too niche. And I think the, you know, the, the, the headline really is that they didn't, the commissioners didn't think audiences would respond. Um, and I didn't really think about that. I just kept trying to get it over the line and the BBC in the end came on board and, and helped us. And I realized that now in hindsight, looking back that we don't really see Jewish heroes on screen in, in a mainstream context. We, we kind of accept the Jewish, um, the comedic Woody Allen type figure uh, and, and maybe the victim um, archetype in documentaries about the Holocaust, but a hero who's leading the story, um, we don't have actually. Um, and making it, a young woman who was the hero. Um, that was a challenge because there was resistance even from our own community. Some of the older men that I had on board for research didn't like it at all. And kind of you turned on their support for me. Um, and I felt that there was, um, there was some resistance in me telling it through a female lens because, because it's, you know, an exciting, quite macho story really. Um, infiltrators of a fascist movement so that's been my experience um, and the the response to the show has just proven that actually you can take something which is seemingly niche and it can tell a bigger story about um, where we are right now which is why people are vulnerable to fascist thought and the Jewish contribution to fighting anti-fascists which is a rich and, and um, dignified history we should be proud of so can, can I say, Sarah, because Sarah, I watched Ridley Road and I thought it's really wonderful. And I and I think I said to you on a message that it was so wonderful to see um, Jews not portrayed as 
are victims, especially females, like you say, it is rare. And it and I thought also of um, black books. You remember the Paul Verhoeven film? Mm. Um, and I remember seeing that film and being so struck by this female protagonist, active protagonist, Jewish woman who was so kind of, um, uh, I don't know what the word is, but like engaged in her own, um, I don't know, future and survival and um, her own Jewishness. And uh, it reminded me a lot of that because because it's so rare to see. Like it's... It... Thank you. It's also just to add, what I think is so important. We we spend a lot of try, time trying to attract non-Jewish audiences to the festival. And um, I think it's really great when a series like Ridley Road really had, as far as I could see, had a very diverse audience. So yeah. congratulations on achieving that too. Thank you. Thank you very much. The um, female character in Inglorious Bastards as well. Um, comes to mind and although the film's named after Doris Bastard she's actually takes up quite a lot of screen time I thought of, um, when you mentioned Black Book Susanna um, but um, to come back to sort of what you ended on there um, Sarah I mean my next question would be um, I mean it overlaps to the previous one what you thought the challenges faced by women in the industry are today and particularly Jewish women I think that's very interesting that final point um, Sarah about the resistance you face from the community um, um, as an example, but I wonder if all three of you could reflect on, on, on the specific challenge faced by women in the industry and, and being Jewish women too. Um, I think for me, it's, you know, it's hard to have that identity um, in a collective sense because it's so, it's so different for every for every woman, every Jewish woman. Um, my dad's family are um, Persian, so there's a Sephardic culture, which is different to the Ashkenazi culture. And I think, and I saw one of my teachers, Angela Gluck, I think is on here, who's one of my teachers and mentors. And what she taught me was, you know, we're, we should be allowed to define our own relationship with the divine. And that may not come from our family and that may not come from our culture and it may not come from our community. It will come here. And going back to Ridley Road, what I wanted to capture with the character of Vivian is that even though she ends up part of this anti-fascist march, which was traditionally not observant, you know, she still had her faith. And I think the more voices of women or Jewish women that we bring into the industry, the more we'll see the different kinds of practices and faiths that uh, women have for themselves and build for themselves. And it's not just the Jewish mother archetype that we're presented in comedy and drama, but something uh, from all parts of the world um, with all different interpretations of their faith. Um, I'm a patrilineal Jew uh, in, in America that's recognized much more broadly in the progressive movement than it is in the UK. Um, and uh, that was something with, with um, Aggie's casting as Vivian, she faced some you know, hostility because people thought that she wasn't Jewish, even though she has a patrilineal heritage. So there's all different kinds of challenges to being a Jewish woman. But I think the answer, as Judy's saying, is, is more voices because the, the, the more we thicken the soup with different identities, the more we'll see that there's not just one kind of cookie cutter, cookie cutter type of Jewish woman. I think as far as Jewish women actresses go of course I mean we're looking at writers and producers and directors as well because we we want powerful roles and we obviously need to be quite aware of the character that we're portraying so it's really we're sort of dependent in many ways as as a Jewish actress um, female actress um, we, we need these powerful roles. I do think that they are coming. I think they're improving and getting stronger, uh, just as gender awareness is also obviously much, there's much far more awareness. And I think the roles are getting significantly stronger. I don't know if our two actresses would agree with that, but um, I, I do think things are changing there. 
Well, I, I think um, certainly in the States, it's definitely changed. If you think about series like Broad City, where the two Jewish actresses who are also the um, writers and creators of the show, they are just there. It's this thing with, with um, I don't know what you call it, uh, not minorities, but other things that are other, not just white, you know, whatever, Caucasian, Christian, I don't know. Um, but like, it's about being people. It's not just about, it's not necessarily being Jewish, although it's Jewish, it may be Jewish stories or Jewish actors or Jewish, it's also just about being people in the same way that um, a lot of my black friends would like to be just represented as human beings <laughs> in a story. Um, it doesn't always have to be about being Jewish. Um, and uh, like Sarah was saying, I think there's a great deal of um, variety um, with how one self identifies and uh, it would behove us all to be, um, you know, very tolerant, more tolerant to um, all those differences. My own mother told me yesterday that, um, when I said I was doing, doing this panel, she was um, shocked because I, According to her, I'm not a real Jew. I'm not Jewish. I'm a phony. I'm not entitled to call myself that. And she's more Jewish than me because she had 20 Jewish people in her class at school. I mean, that's my own family. So, so <laughs> it's it comes from every direction. Um, and um, I think uh, we could all be um, much much more generous and more tolerant to one another, and and accept that Judaism comes in all different um, shapes and sizes. It's, it sounds clear that, that um, you know, there's a lot of resistance coming from within our own community, let alone from outside the community before, you know, um, um, to, to these issues. I mean, I suppose, I mean, I think Judy used to talk about these, um, well, the, um, these powerful roles and that we need wider roles um, for Jewish women. And I suppose there's two issues there. One, are, are we seeing more of these roles? Are we just seeing the stereotypes of the Jewish mother um, or maybe the young girl like Susie Gold? Um, and when these roles are created, are, are Jewish women getting those roles? Or does it matter? Well, I, I mean, I think we are still a long way behind with, with British Jewish film. I mean, certainly we had, we had this in Ridley Road, but it's I, I, it's rare, you know. I think where we're seeing it more is in Israel and the U.S. Um, unorthodox and Netflix are, are actually a huge contributor to this improvement. But you know, when you have Netflix with Shira Haas, again, the point I made um, to Sarah about Ridley Road, I was. So many people talked to me, non-Jews talked to me about unorthodox. They were approaching me and really keen to talk about this. And I, and I think we, we do owe a lot to um, Netflix for that production, but I, I do still feel, and I, I please contradict me if you know differently, but from what I see as a film festival and programming for festivals, um, it's it's we're not there yet in in the UK with British film. Um, Suzanne and Sarah, would you like to come in? Yeah, I totally I totally agree with you, Judy. Um, and you have things on Netflix as well. Like I think it's on Netflix, My Unorth Unorthodox Life, which is a reality TV show, um, which has you know it's 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 brilliant and it's like I said before, it's about people. Um, and it's, it's wonderfully compelling and I think it really helps open um, people who maybe are not Jewish or don't have experience of um, Jewish culture uh, in, a, in a really wonderfully inclusive way. Um, yeah. All I'll add is that for me it's less about starting from the roles and more starting from the story and the perspective. Um, and given that there's only 260,000 Jewish people in the United Kingdom, but that arguably our opposition party has lost its way on anti-Semitism and hasn't recovered. So the fact that our, our politics is really being shaped by attitudes, myths and racism to Jewish people, we really need to unpack 
still a lot of confusion and a lot of racist beliefs about the Jewish experience. Um, in, in, in promoting Ridley Road, I came across journalists who didn't realize, for example, that Hasidic people weren't rich. They thought they were very wealthy because they dressed well. Um, people assume that there is still this powerful banking media network of Jewish people running things. And these are educated professional people that have these views. Um, Israel is still um, a, a very, as we know, a complex, painful issue that people who have no experience or knowledge of the Middle East feel confident in wading in and chastising Israel. Um, we need more stories about that on television and more films about that from a British perspective for, for the British audiences to locate themselves within these debates. Um, and we're frightened of doing that. Um, it's still a hot potato to write about Israel or talk about Israel. And uh, we need to do that. We need to use the creative energy of our country and the talent in our country to help us through still um, a quite shameful um, racist time. And, and, and a lot of the racism to the Jewish people has been revealed in their response to Ridley Road because publications on the left and the right both said it wasn't as bad as all that. You would never have that um, thrown at any other minority group that your racism isn't as bad as you're saying it is and we know better than you do um, and that was quite shocking so for me it's it you know if the, if the stories are in the right place then the roles will follow um I do wonder like and Sarah you mentioned just how few of us there are in Britain I mean it strikes me that outside of maybe London and Manchester most people in the UK won't have met a Jewish person so um when when you stick them on TV you have to kind of overcode them not not you but one you know there's a tendency to do it so most people might associate judaism with hasidic jews because they're easy to represent whereas right. when they look when they look like most people on this call uh, uh um, <laughs> that's a lot harder um um to, to do but it, it, i suppose the question that's hanging over this is why aren't we able to get more of these stories on british screens like who are the gatekeepers um you know, Judy mentioned the United States and Israel. Um, I know they're large Jewish populations. What comes to mind to me is France. Um, and there's two shows on Netflix that people might be familiar with, Call My Agent and um, Family Business that has the same Jewish actress in. And um, whilst the first one doesn't really deal with Jewishness, the second one's about a Jewish butcher's family that goes into drug dealing. Very interesting, um, especially the female roles. But I why aren't we getting these stories onto screen so we can prevent present more textured views of Jewishness? I think and, one, of the, um, sorry, one of the issues, and I'm certainly not naming names, but we have Jews, very established Jews in the film industry in the UK who do not stand up uh, and declare themselves Jewish or follow Jewish themes. Um, and, and it really hampers us. And it's certainly during the festival, the years, the, the 25 years at the festival, it, I found it very sad, you know, when we've reached out to people in the film industry. I mean, obviously they've been very generous Jewish men and women as well, who pitch up and who talk and who contribute and who make films, but we're still, not coming, or a lot of people are not coming out as Jewish for whatever reason. Um, and a lot of them are very, very talented. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, there is obviously an anti-Jewish bias that um, we, we might not want to confront to the extent that you know, it exists. Um, but one of the other myths, as well as kind of the, you know, secret cabal of Jews controlling everything is that Jews dominate entertainment. So I wonder if they're in a commissioner in it or a gatekeeper's mind when making a decision, they think, well, they will be fine or they are overrepresented. Um, that's certainly something I have heard. There's, it, 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 people think that there isn't, there isn't an issue of representation. My, my experience is that, um, and I'm sorry to say that, but my experience is that there is a, a, a layer, deep layer of anti-Semitism in the gatekeepers of the industry. Sorry, my cat's going crazy here. <laughs> um, uh, especially in the casting directors who are perhaps 
Um, I'm going to say best case scenario, they're ignorant or naive, but, um, and in even, um, I had a very painful and uncomfortable experience being asked to audition for Unorthodox, which I thought was the most wonderful show. Um, but in its early stages, I, I wasn't told anything about what the project was. I, I had no context for it whatsoever. I've told Nathan this story, but um, uh, the casting director has nothing to do with the production, but the casting directors in Britain um, asked me to um, prepare a scene, um, at, which is quite a large part, to prepare a scene. Um, and I did that. They said it would be helpful if the actress could speak German, which I can't, but um, that was fine. It wasn't a problem. And then at nine o'clock on a Sunday night, my audition was 10 o'clock on Tuesday morning. I had an email from my agent saying, they want you to learn it in Yiddish. Um, now I don't speak Yiddish and uh, I said that to her and she said they say it doesn't matter they're sending you a phonetic version um, they didn't let me know if it was American Yiddish or British Yiddish or there was there was not, no context for it whatsoever so I received this script which had all of the other parts taken out of the center and just my own parts written phonetically in Yiddish um, but I don't know how to pronounce them even or how where the stress goes or I know nothing so I said, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not doing this. Um, please tell them that I've learned the scene in English. I will come and I'll read it and I will um, perform that. And then if they give me more time, I will work with a Yiddish speaker in Yiddish. And they said, if you don't do the Yiddish, um, you can't come for the audition. And I said, but I don't speak it. And they said, it doesn't matter that you can't speak it. Just have a go. You can make up words. Um, I said, that's incredibly racist. <laughs> Um, and I rang equity and I complained um, and of course nothing happened um, and then of course I saw, saw the show and I just thought it was completely wonderful and the opposite of the experience that I'd had at the audition and I felt so grief stricken well I didn't get to the audition but I felt so grief stricken that I hadn't been able to push through whatever that gate was that was keeping me between trying to get that part because you know I wanted to do it when I saw it I wanted to do it <laughs> really wanted to do it <laughs> I thought it was wonderful. Um, so, so, so there are different layer, layers of gatekeepers that keep, you know, people it, out. It interests me. Um, thank you for your story, Susanna. Yeah, it sorry it was long. Me, you know, we're here, we are women who are really concerned about these issues. Nathan, you're here too. You know, how, what ideas can we exchange and discuss that we we feel we can bring about change? I, I I think we you know we we rehearse these problems ourselves. Um, how can we bring about change and accelerate change? I think this helps. I think dialogue helps, and um, being like you say, being honest about the experience um and i think we are actually doing as you know a, a, as, as much as we can to alert people to their own biases and for some reason uh anti-jewish bias is it, it is denied um it's denied on political space it's denied in in the entertainment space and i think um, reminding people that they may have it if they aren't, if that's not their experience. And it's okay, it doesn't make them an anti Semite, uh, but it could, they could work on it and overcome it to um, embrace more stories. Um, and I think events like this really help and, and calling people up um, in, in person when you might have just let it go and just say, well, sorry, what do you mean by that? I don't understand where that, where that opinion's coming from and, um, and allowing them to unpack what might may be a biased thought i think there's incremental um steps to to progress um as well as big legislative change we can all we can all make an impact sometimes in in just a moment of an exchange with someone else and and no doubt you did in your battle to get ridley road made um there must have been a lot of people that were touched by your arguments yeah yeah i was really touched by the response um and worried by by the response there was um one institution uh which i won't name and shame but they wouldn't they wouldn't put it on its um slate because they said it didn't meet its diversity requirements and i said you have another jewish show on the slate um it's an award-giving body this institution and they said no 
um, so I said, well, you haven't got a, you haven't got a Jewish represent show represented, but it doesn't meet your your um, diversity requirements. Yeah. And then we got into the issue of whiteness and explaining that even though Jewish people often are white passing, um, it may not mean that they're afforded the same kind of white privilege that a non-Jewish white person experiences. And so bringing the Jewish question into a, a racial dimension uh, often frightens people, Jewish and non-Jewish, but it's necessary because, because um, just because you're white passing doesn't mean you haven't experienced some hostility or some unconscious bias that's going on underneath. Um, but I had to confront them and, and they did you turn on that. But it's, it's exhausting, you know, you do have to, you're very, people are very used to saying, well, that's just the way it is. And, 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 and it takes a lot of energy. And this was almost the 62 group inspired me to, in a very minuscule way, um, uh, adopt some of their tactics, which is just being relentless. And, and activism itself is a very relentless enterprise. It's thankless. You probably, in your lifetime, die disappointed, but you've got to keep trying. <laughs> Um, and celebrate the victories when they come. And the victory for many people was that we'd made Ridley Road, despite huge challenges, not just uh, on being Jewish, but with COVID and financing and everything like that. Um, and, that and that when you get there, that you use that platform and you, and you celebrate it when you, when you do achieve it, which, which feels very good. And, and, and I, can see, I can see change and, and, and the change in conversation already, which has been very satisfying. I, I wonder as we're talking how much we are um, hampered by stereotypes in earlier films, you know, how much has that impacted um, on the film industry today? I don't know what people feel about that. Sorry, I missed that last, my, my, my um, internet froze. I just missed the last question, Judy, that you just posed. I wonder how Jewish characters, actors, actresses are um, hampered and restricted by stereotypes that have taken root in the film industry in earlier years. Again, I think it's about the person who's penning the stereotype because behind every stereotype there is a, you know, there's a, there's a grain of something. Um, I, you know, I meet Jewish mothers all the time are like, well, this is a really stereotypical Jewish mother, but that's who she is. And but it's it's I think the intention of the writing. If 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 the if the writer is trying to make a cheap joke uh, or glossing over something using a stereotypical character, then you see through it. But um, sometimes some some comedies who which do have an authentic voice, uh, like Grandma's House, for example, by Simon Amstel. You know that was his experience. You could say that that falls into kind of the trope that we're used to, but it also told quite a sweet story about his life at his grandma's house. Um, again, I think it's about who we trust in telling those stories and who we invest in, what voices we invest in. I agree with that, Sarah, and I, I would I would use something like Shiva Baby, which is the movie, the American movie that's out at the moment, um, as an example of that. So it's written by a Canadian Jew, female Jew. Um, it's full of Jewish tropes. It is, it's a sort of dark comedy. I don't know if you've seen it, but um, it's a, uh, and it's got um, like huge amounts of Jewish, um, Jewishisms in it. But because of the intention and the warmth and the experience of the writer, um, it just um, takes you into that world and uh, not for a second. Do, even, even the people within the world are saying, you know, are, are, are commenting on their own Jewishness, which I, you know, is a very Jewish thing. So um, I, I felt very comfortable watching that, as opposed to the recent Royal Court debacle, Herschel Fink <laughs> problem, which was um, not so comfortable. Yeah. I, I must add at this point that there is an interview with the um, director in, in a past issue of Jewish Renaissance of Shiver Baby. Um, so I can draw your attention to that. Oh, great. <laughs> um, and it's a wonderful film if you haven't seen it, although be prepared for some fruity dialogue within the first <laughs> few minutes. Um, I wonder, just reflecting on what you've all said, that, that I mean, we have two issues here. We have obviously the outside community, um, um, which I'm going to put to one side for now, um, because, you know, to answer Judy's question, where can we begin? 
um, it seems that we have a problem within our own community. Um, um, and, and, and Sarah, you referred to white passing. And often when people complain about Jewish roles and people who aren't playing them, they have an Ashkenazi Jewish role in mind. So even within our own community, we forget the diversity um, of, of Jewishness and Judaism in our own community as we wonder who should be best to play a role. Um, and it takes me back to the idea of um, Seinfeld um, back in the early 90s and that Seinfeld kind of straddled that divide of sitcoms that weren't very Jewish and um, executives who didn't want sitcoms to be too Jewy. And I wonder if we're still in, and that was in the early 90s, okay, and obviously in the United States that's, that's changed. And I wonder if we're still stuck in that mode. Um, I think something, um, you know, that was said earlier about, um, I think you said it, Judy, establishment Jews in the British film industry who hamper us. Um, and I wonder if, you know, sometimes we're our own best and en uh, worst enemies. Is it, would that be fair? Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Um, and I mean, there are, and I, I mean, I, I don't have an issue with non-Jews playing Jewish parts at all in the same way that I think Jewish actors and actresses should be allowed to play non-Jewish parts and that proves more difficult in, in the casting world and the producers and that seems to be something that's harder to push through with it but I mean in America it's much less of an issue if you think about Scarlett Johansson, Natalie Portman, Mila Kunis they you know um uh I can't remember what I was going to say now I'll leave it there for the moment I'll come back to my original point <laughs> thank you I mean, what we're talking about, Nathan, is, you know, it is our society, you know, it's very different being a Jew in the US and being a Jew in the UK. You know, it hasn't changed that much. Um, I think it, it is changing. Um, and I think I look at the, the title, you know, of the Jewish Renaissance book and Age of Confidence, and I think it's very inspiring. Uh, but are we there yet? You know, it's it's a work in progress. Certainly in the UK, it's um, it's still we're we're not really really out as Jews. That would be my um, my conclusion of the current situation. Whereas in America, it's always been. You know, you can have a lot of street cred as a an American Jew. Would, would you agree with us, Sarah? Well, I mean, yeah. It's it's. I'm glad you brought that up it it was is noticeable to me the experience of being jewish in in america uh, versus being a jew in england when when i've moved here it was like peak corbyn controversy and um i got invited to a group re reboot which is a group of like um it's like a sort of retreat weekend where jews from all kind of walks of life meet and discuss it's a fantastic organization um, but there were a lot of like liberal New York Jewish people who were, um, they, one of them put their hands up and said, I feel like we're being really Ashkenormative, uh, which was a funny word I hadn't heard. And um, everyone was very earnestly saying, I think we're being Ashkenormative, we need to widen it and be more in, you know, um, intersectional with our Jews. And I, and I was the only non-American in the weekend. And I said, you know, Jews in England aren't worrying about being Ashkenormative. They're worrying about that, whether they should leave next week or today. The threat is different. Um, and Zionism isn't a dirty word in America as it is in England. Um, so there's two things. There's, there's the, the, the inclusivity of the American progressive movement has really startled me because for a long time being a patrilineal Jew and you know whose mother died when I was a child and was raised by my dad, uh, I did feel um, a sort of stigma and being told who I was and who I wasn't and being told I wasn't Jewish, even though I felt Jewish. And um, it was again, Angela uh, at New London, who, who really gave me, as well as his education, this ownership on who I was and um, being told who you are or who you aren't really hasn't got anything to do with the divine. So, so I do feel there's, and I see it a lot with um, people who either, fall in love with someone who's not Jewish and it causes terrible heartbreak and sometimes it can pull families apart. I even met a woman who um, has no 
Jewish family, but for some reason wears a Star of David and lights candles every Friday and she can't explain it. It's just this connection she has. So I do think there's a sort of, um, it's time in our country to have a more inclusive movement, which um, allows people to come to the table who are feeling that they want to belong to the community. And, and, and I think that can only enrich a community rather than feeling sort of frightened and hostile to, to the interloper, which is this um, fear that I think a lot of people carry. Yeah, and also um, the, you know, as I get older, I, and especially with the rise of fascism and the right in the world and everything that's going on, we're going to that, um, I feel more connection to my Jewishness and also my father dying. Um, makes me weirdly feel closer to my Jewish heritage um, than I did before. And like, there is a lot of suspicion about that. I mean, even like I said, from my own Gentile mother um, and resistance to it. And, uh, you know, th that's the last place you want to be having it. But Nathan, what you were saying about even within our own community, um, before, I, I think it's very interesting to use the Royal Court and its its issue that they've had recently as an example of this, because it's really divided the Jewish community as, as well in the industry. There's been quite a divide between uh, people who have, um, who come from a religious Jewish um, lens and um, have uh, got their um, experience and then um, non religious Jews, cultural um, Jews uh, who have their own experience and um, people have gone about trying to um, heal that wound that's been caused uh, by the Royal Court with what happened in very different ways and it's divided and upset quite a lot of people and the Royal Court have got their way out of them, I mean, they're well meaning but they are so out of their depth, they've got absolutely no idea what they're doing. Um, because they don't know anything about it. So it, it's been quite an interesting time <laughs> behind the scenes. Yeah, I, 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 for what it's worth, my feeling is, I think echoing what's been said, that we put up too many bar barriers within our own community. You know, patri patrilineal, matrilineal, reform, liberal, Judaism, are your kids Jewish, are they not Jewish? How Jewish are you? Um, and, and, um, and, and some of the experiences that you've spoken about attest to this, um, um, you know, men complaining uh, uh, that, that about a female protagonist, you know, and it shouldn't be through that lens. Um, so I suppose one answer, Judy, is that we need to, um, I think, heal our own divisions before we can confront the outside world's um, view. Um, I'm going to ask one final question before we turn it over. And I think you've already alluded it to, I mean, um, is Jew face has been sort of much in the news recently with Sarah Silverman and David Bedil. And um, I wanted to hear your views on that, on that debate. Um, I think it's a valid point. I think it, if you're gonna, if you're making the argument that Jewish people uh, are an exception when you talk about my minority identity politics, I think it's a valid point. Um, do I think it's the, the highest priority on what's going on right now? No. Um, I think there's bigger issues, more dangerous pressing issues uh, that, that would be um, worthy of our attention. Um, because the truth is, because a lot of Jewish people are white passing, they can play um, non-Jewish roles in a way that black people or trans people can't. So it, it, it's a valid point, but there's a slight false equivalence for me um, on making it the frontline issue when we got fascists in the corner. To be honest. Yeah. Um, well, I, I agree. I think we have to pick our battles. I, 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 what I wanted to bring to the table, which I think is quite interesting, is at the moment there are two film, well, one film and one TV series being made about Golda Meir. I don't know if our audience are aware of this, but, you know, so we have Dame Helen Mirren um, playing Golda in an upcoming uh, biopic. And shortly we have Shira Haas from Orthodox, 
um, playing in playing the young Golda in Lioness, which is being directed by Barbara Streisand. So um, it's just a plea really for all sorts. Sometimes the best actor or actress gets the role. And I suspect we're going to see a fantastic depiction of Golda from, um, from Dave Helen Mirren. So yeah. It's a roundabout way of responding to your question, Nathan. Okay. Um, I think I think that wraps up my questions. Um, and and um, thank you very much. Um, we, I think we're going to open it to the floor now. Is that, is that right, Rebecca? Yes, thank you, Nathan. And thank you to our panel for such an interesting discussion. Um, so we've touched on so many things. Just to remind people that we are taking questions in the chat, or I think some of you also are using the Q&A function, please uh, send them in. And we've had uh, quite a few come in already. They, they touch a little bit on what we've talked about, but um, some are specifically addressed to some of you. So we'll start off, we've had one asking, what was Sarah's reaction to the negative press that two of the main characters in Ridley Road were not played by Jewish actors. Um, we, we've sort of touched on this a little bit just now, but um, I suppose um, is that Eddie Marson then and Tom Veery who played Jack? Yeah, I think one of the things that was misleading was when we did a press release, um, it, it looked like uh, there was like three leads, four leads and that some of them weren't Jewish, but, and, and actually that came to a gender bias. There's only one lead in Ridley Road and that's Agnes O'Casey. And um, we cast her on her ability as a, a brilliant actress and also her connection to her to her Judaism, which was painful and complex and, and patrilineal. So for me, we had a Jewish lead and we had an ensemble cast, which was a mixture of Jewish and non-Jewish actors. And I mean, to Judy's point, who wouldn't want Eddie Marzan playing their lead Jewish thug? I mean, he's just, he's telling, he's helping the cause by telling a brilliant story using his great gift. Um, and his politics on and off the screen as well. He's such an ally. He, it meant so much to him to, 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 he's from Bethnal Green, he's from this area, he's witnessed anti-Semitism. Um, it was the first time he felt he was um, putting his work and his politics in alignment um, and that's where I feel like the the Jew face argument kind of falls short because you don't want to compromise the quality of a of, of a story um, when someone is really convincing and and able to play the role. Thank you, Sarah. Did uh, did Judy or Susanna or Nathan? Do you want to add anything there? Um, just to add, I mean, I don't know if you you know, but. Um, Eddie Marzan got quite a lot of shtick for playing a Jewish character. It's not the first time he's played it, but I think he um, he had quite a lot of issues fired at him because of taking that role, which is crazy. Yeah. I, I only have to add that, like I said before, I like and like Sarah says just now, it's the best person for the role and I think you know it's very important that we don't get locked into only Jews can play Jews, only gay men can play gay men, only lesbian, I mean, it was like no it's got to be the best um, performer for that part. Nathan did you want to add anything or oh, maybe we've exhausted the, <laughs> do we need to unmute you? <laughs> Members of my family would, would love this. Um, <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to say I love Eddie Marzan, and um, I, you know, it wasn't a problem for me. And 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 if I didn't know enough about um, Eddie Marzan, having seen him in his previous roles, I would have just assumed he was Jewish. Mm. I don't know what that says. Um, and then and then finding out that he's not would surprise me more. <laughs> Yes, yeah, indeed, yes. I'm going to move on because we, we have talked about that topic quite a bit. Um, we have another question which is asking about um, a particular film called Doe. I don't know if you've come across that. Uh, a UK Jewish comedy film, Doe, has never been shown on British television. 
is there a resistance from British broadcasters to show good Jewish British films? And, and again, we've touched on that a little bit. And Sarah, you spoke about the resistance to getting Ridley Road made. Do you think that's because of, well, tell us what, what you think that was that was down to, that resistance that you spoke about? I mean, I think it was, I've sort of spoken to it. it. I think it was regarded as niche at the time, but this was eight years ago. And I think Trump changed a lot because people were asking, started asking questions about why we were being drawn to sort of the populist strongman and were we just getting nastier um and so really you can tell a lot about a country or a or a politic on how they treat the jewish minority so i think what helped get ridley road made was saying actually for for a, it's a universal story because the jewish experience will open up much broader themes on tolerance on um, this idea of nostalgia, of immigration blaming. Um, so I think even though I don't, I can't speak to the experience of Doe, it sounds great, I wanna watch it, but um, I think the only silver lining in, in, in an increasingly frightening dark time is that I think there is a change in, in, in how people are, certainly for the experience of Ridley Road, embracing something that would have been niche and is now Al Pegas tell a, tell a much uh, broader universal story. And uh, just to jump in there, if you, UK Jewish Film Festival showed Doe, so I guess, you know, there are going to be films which are niche for Jewish audiences and they're not all gonna make it to television, but check out UK Jewish Film each year. And well, what is that? Yeah. Can you tell us a bit about it, Judy? I haven't, I haven't heard of it. A bit about the film? Um, not in detail. It's, it's about maybe even as much as 10 years old. Uh, and it's about a baker. Hence, so, you know, and it's a comedy. Um, again, we don't get that many British comedies. Mm -hmm. But I, I do think a lot of these niche films, because they're Jewish themed, they, they don't get to television. Mm. They don't get shown on television and they maybe only get shown in film festivals. And in the UK, that's that's the UK Jewish Film Festival. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are there subjects that you would like to see brought to TV or film on Jewish subjects that you haven't? We haven't seen. We haven't seen so many. But um, do you have particular projects you'd like to get shown in the future that address unheard Jewish history, unheard Jewish voices, maybe. Uh... I, mean, I, I certainly feel that there is space and, and necessity in seeing Israel and the, and the forming of that state and the conflict in that state um, in, a, in, in it, all its complex, painful, miraculous nature. Um, I think we need to see it. And I think people are scared to, but um, it's time, I think, that we understood more about that country. I also think documentaries, we haven't really touched on documentaries, but we've just done, um, this year we launched the Short Doc Fund and five short docs um, under three minutes were made. Um, and I think that's the, how we get our stories across. This is how maybe we dispel misunderstandings, um, stereotypes, and invite people in to Jewish life and to see how diverse it is and not the other and not alien. Susanna, can we unmute Susanna, please? Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say um, on, a, on a much um, less intellectual note, although I don't know, that's me judging myself. I've always wanted to write a sort of um, Jewish, British Jewish female lens um, version of a Woody Allen. So very small, you know, London centric. I mean, only because that's where I'm from, but equivalent to Manhattan. Um, it's it's a project that's ongoing in my head. So, yes. Uh, <laughs> I create scenes from it frequently, but then I, I need to sit down when I'm not um, writing novels and and um, and write that. I'd love to write that. I don't know if it, anyone would ever be interested in getting it made, but that would be my my dream. 
I'd love to see that. <laughs> <laughs> Judy, there's a challenge for UK Jewish film there. <laughs> to oh, a new project. I'll hold my breath. <laughs> Nathan, anything that you think would be great to see that's not been tackled? Yes, Jewish academics living in Wales. Um, <laughs> no, but seriously, I, I do think, um, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd like to see what Susanna comes up with, um, but I do think showing a diversity of life outside of um, the metropolis um, would be, um, and that, you know, not so Scottish, Northern Ireland, um, um, Northern Irish, Welsh, um, stories and stories that aren't always um, centered in cities, rural Jews, Jews who speak other languages, Sephardi Jews, um, you know, not just Haredim, uh, um, that sort of thing. I did want to add one point um, that's always struck me. Um, and I think of something, sorry, uh, I should have asked earlier, I think something Judy said about a, um, an age of confidence is there's been so much flowering of British Jewish literature, um, particularly in the last probably 20 years. Um, and you think Howard Jacobson is now considered a, was he the Jewish Jane Austen? Um, you know, so we have this confidence on the page and, you know, they're winning national prizes and not just Jewish prizes, is why haven't we translated, Ridley Rhodes, one example, when I say translated them, um, you know, adapted into, in, into more film and television, because the stories are there already written and are winning acclaim from all kinds of audiences. And yet, um, you know, disobedience is another one. Um, it's a little bit, um, you know, North London female perspective, um, uh, not Woody Allen. And, and I just wonder why we haven't made that step. Who is we? I mean, all, all these projects need... Um... Well, not me, I, I just... Uh, <laughs> I mean, when I say we, the British Jewish community, um, filmmakers, um, um, producers, directors, I mean... Funding. Maybe, maybe sorry. Funding. <laughs> These projects need funding, yeah. Funding is why, and 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 partly um, what Sarah talked about earlier um, with um, you know the sort of idea of things being niche. Uh, my second novel that comes out next year, I want to adapt for television. It does have uh, the family is Jewish, non-religious Jews. Um, it's not a Jewish story, but it's. Jewish people, um, and uh, and I but I imagine that might be considered quite niche. In the novel, it does deal with quite a lot of that idea of even the book. It's you know the characters themselves thinking of themselves as niche and not you know relevance, etc. So I'll be interested to see, as Judy said, whether there's any funding. <laughs> Is there any funding? Who knows. Well, I wanted to ask actually about looking more at the the question of equality for women in, in the industry on the back of the Me Too movement. What has changed? Do you think that's made a real impact in TV and film here? Or is it the case? I mean, Sarah, you're in the States now. Do you think it's being in the States that has uh, really propelled you further? Um, can you be a successful filmmaker? Uh, woman filmmaker, never mind Jewish filmmaker in the UK. So maybe maybe we can just think a little bit about what's happened since Me Too. Do you, yes, do you certainly. To I, I mean, I, there's de definitely a, a tangible difference um, before Me Too. Uh, first of all, we've just been more proactive in getting the data on, on commissioners and what they commission. And now we can point to certain people and say, you commissioned 80% men last year and women. Um, and now uh, commissioners have to face the possibility of press scrutiny um, and complaints from organized writing groups of women who are saying it's not good enough. We have the economic argument. We know that actually the majority of people in control of the remote control in homes are women. Um, we know about advertising. Um, so there's no reason why you have such disproportionate commission figures on British television. In America, the economic argument, because it's a hyper-capitalist culture, works. So you just have more um, content written by women and for women. Um, but I do, I do think it's changing. It's not changing fast enough, obviously. But um, it, before it was just, it was. I mean, one of the reasons I moved, it was just a closed door. You didn't stand a chance. And maybe there was the odd panel and the odd workshop. But in terms of trusting you with a lot of money and a lot of power in making a show, which let's be honest, films and TV shows, we're talking about 
trusting someone with millions and millions of pounds to make something on the whole. Um, it, people felt safer giving that to men or men felt more um, more confident in receiving it and that's the thing about any kind of gender revolution is it's it's both ways it's like do we feel confident enough to ask for the thing that we need or do we tell ourselves that we're not ready a lot of younger women I work with feel they're not ready and they'll slave away on scripts for years and years whereas men just feel more confident on the whole in my experience in sending off what they've written on a first draft so it's um it's a cultural shift. Uh, for me, it's moving in the right direction. Um, and it's a very exciting time, especially in Hollywood, to be a, a female writer. I'm having a great time. And your, your campaign raising films is addressing this then, is it? Because that, that, I mean, childcare is a major part of the reason why women have been held back traditionally. Uh, so yeah, this it's it's, well, I'm not a founder of that, although I was like a, um, a an early voice to promote to promote the cause. And, and like in any industry, you know, um, women who have children often have to make the terrible choice between their career and raising a family. And um, we we did the research and got the data and got the numbers that you know, if leading actor went from uh, a single trailer to a two way or a three way, you could probably fund childcare provision on the set um, which would mean you you wouldn't lose not just actors but crew from entry level if they had a childcare provision so um, Charlotte Riley and Tom Hardy are sort of spearheading that they've set up a nursery I think it's the Warner Brothers slot they have they've set up a nursery mm -hmm. and they're trying to do a deal with Disney and Netflix and um, and it's a it's a real issue that could make a lot of productive change if we provide that for, 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 for all carers. Mm. Susanna, have you felt hampered by being here uh, in the UK as opposed to, well, you know, well, but I mean, I've, I've worked a little in the US and um, my I have an American agent and my experience of auditioning in America was very, very different in that, you know, the small um, experiences that I've had and the small amount of work that I've done there has been very different. The attitude to me I don't know whether this is to anything to do with being a woman or not, um, but just the attitude there is not a much more open. They're more used to a varied faces. Um, I didn't feel like when I walked in, they were looking at me as a, you know, some sort of um, slightly alien to the um, endemic culture of that. You know, it's much more of a melting pot. Um, People were pleased just to meet me. If I read well, they took it just on face value. It was what I presented. There was nothing else behind it. So, so um, uh, here I don't know because I have very little other experience, but certainly um, I do feel as a woman that I have been, yeah, I mean, God, like, yes, I, I've had direct experience. I mean, if we're talking about being a female, yes, I've had casting directors lie to me and my agent about the amounts of money that I'm being paid in relation to my male co-star. That's in theatre as well, not just in television, um, you know, and more fool them because actors talk to one another. Um, I, yeah, I've had all kinds of, mm. yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, that's a whole different panel. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> 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 Did you, did you did you want to add anything? Um, no, I, I think me too. Just, um, as gender as you Sarah's said. saying, you know, I, I think we're running behind what's happening. I think she's in a good place right now. <laughs> like I don't it. think yeah. we've caught up yet. Yes. <laughs> so stay yeah. where you are, Sarah. <laughs> yeah. I might come and join you. <laughs> <laughs> and we've had um, we've some of the conversation has focused a bit on the negative so I've also had a question in which maybe tie, begins to tie up this evening on a more positive note um, we've had a question about um, who are your or who are your role mo models your mentors um, and who are the people who have paved the way for you um, and, may, and you know maybe there are people who are inspiring you today in the industry uh, they can be Jewish or non-Jewish. Um, so, um, Judy, wh wh what do yeah. you think? Um, well, of course, I'm speaking from the voice of um, running a, a film festival for 25 years. And actually, one really inspiring year 
and then two or three others after it, we would, um, a group of female Jewish film festival directors would meet every year at the Berlinale from sort of 1998, my second year onwards. I was so much picked up and hugged and taken along in this huge festival in Berlin by the, direct, the then directors of the Washington Jewish Film Festival, the San Francisco Jewish Film Festival, um, and several others. Um, and Nicola Galina of the Berlin Jewish Film Festival would invite us all. And this was such a nurturing, fertile start to running a film festival for me, an international one as well. And a lot of them are friendships I still have today. So they were certainly really powerful and inspiring women. Thank you. Susanna, people who've paved the way for you or inspire you today. I think, um, I wouldn't say I have um, mentors, although I had a, a male um, drama teacher at, at, at drama school called Brian Asprey, who's a director and writer in his own right, um, who was really wonderful and helped me to see that women didn't have to be um, in a box, uh, uh, if I can put it like that. He, he just gave me the freedom to just be who I am and who I was at that time. But I would say now my, um, the trailblazers that I think are sort of my contemporaries. I have, I'm on a WhatsApp group with a load of uh, friends of mine who are all actors, um, like um, Sam Sparrow, who is in your show, Sarah, and Tracy Ann Oberman, who is in your show, um, Natasha McElhone and um, Indira Varma. And uh, there, are, I mean, there are about 15 of us, Sienna Guillory, and um, <clears throat> we're all very, very supportive. And um, just lift one another up, I think, um, in general, and strong, opinionated, you know, creative women. Sounds great. Thank <laughs> you. Sarah, inspirations for you? Oh, so many. Um, Angela Gluck, who I, I think is on here, who helped me and teach me in my spiritual journey and also broadened out the, the responsibility of, 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 of the Jewish idea of Zadaka of social justice and her work with refugees has really stayed with me and um, opened up our contribution, not just to our own communities, but other people in need. Um, Biban Kidron is a Jewish <laughs> filmmaker who um, is a mentor of mine, a good friend of mine, um, who's you know been through it and has a great sense of humor and we just laugh about all our challenges. And Nicola Schindler, um, who produced Ridley Road, who's just fearless and um, such an inspiration just on, on, the, on the work she, the work she's made um, and the conversation she started and, and, and being a mother of three kids. And, and yeah, it's, it's women like that who I call and ask advice and, and yeah, hold, like Susanna says, hold me up and, and celebrate my successes with me. And, and when I feel I can't, you know, keep going, they say, you've got to. Um, so I'm very lucky in that front, yeah. Thank you, thanks. Um, okay, I think that that's probably a good place to, to uh, draw it to an end tonight. We've just had a note in from Ruth Rabin, who says, Solomon and Gaynor by Paul Morrison was set in Wales. So uh, there we go. <laughs> a non-London film, which feels like a, a positive place to end the evening. And thank you so much to, to all of you, our wonderful panel who have spoken about your own experiences and your thoughts about where we can go in the future with Jewish film and women in film. It's been a real inspiration to hear you speak and I'm sure we'll be celebrating all of your successes. Uh, we'll continue to celebrate your successes into the future. So thank you. And to Nathan, our excellent chair for, for this evening. Thank you to everybody and to our audience for your questions and joining us tonight. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you.